Um, okay, um, hello everyone and welcome. Um, I'm very happy to see these many beautiful and familiar faces on my very small screen. Um, for those of you who um, don't know me, my name is Mahyar Hadigi, um, HPP 2012. Um, I'm the current president of the uh, Historic Preservation Alumni Association. And um, I would like to welcome everyone to the HPPA virtual symposium. Um, this idea of um, having and hosting a uh, virtual symposium came to our mind when we found out that because of the pandemic, we're not going to see each other in um, national trust uh, conferences or APT conferences. So we decided to um, kind of put together another platform so we can see each other and talk with each other and also to hear about our work and research because um, that would be very important for the current students to know about um, alumni work. So um, although you uh, received many emails from us or um, through the newsletter or social media, um, you already know the program. I'm gonna briefly talk about um, um, the program. Um, so tonight, um, and when I say tonight, this is like uh, US tonight, but uh, we have guests from all around the world. So um, at this session, we will have our um, keynote lecture by Bishop Jennifer Baskerville uh, Burroughs, uh, who is a um, HPP 94. Um, Professor Michael Tomlin, we're going to introduce her, uh, but I'm not sure if he can uh, join us or not, we'll see. Um, at the end of the lecture, we will have time for questions and a brief discussion um, that would, um, Michael Tomlin would uh, moderate that uh, Q&A, but if he couldn't join us, I think we can, uh, we can manage that. Um, after that, um, Michael will uh, give us an update on the Historic Preservation Planning Program at Cornell. That's, that's why we were all waiting for Michael because he had a lot uh, to do tonight. Um, however, after uh, Professor Tomlin at uh, um, uh, 9.30 uh, Eastern Time, US and Canada, Pro Professor Jeff Chusid will host a trivia night and he will provide the instruction for that. I'm sure that we all gonna uh, enjoy uh, hearing from Jeff and being in that uh, trivia. Um, we will continue the symposium tomorrow, Saturday at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time, US and Canada with three presentations. And then at uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, US, Canada with uh, current uh, uh, student presentations followed by two other alumni presentations. Uh, we will have our last session on uh, Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern uh, Time, U.S. and Canada with two other presentations. And at noon Eastern Time, we will have our closing keynote talk by uh, Sherry Freer, HPP 99, and Professor Michael Tomlin will um, introduce her. Hopefully by that time, Michael can join us. Um, so, um, I have a few housekeeping notes before uh, we get started. Um, we would love to see each other's face. Um, this is one reason that uh, we put together this um, a symposium. So feel free to turn on your camera, um, unless you have to turn it off for a personal reason. Um, however, please mute yourself during the, uh, um, the lectures. Um, we are recording the sessions and the recorded videos will be available in HPPA YouTube channel within the next week or so. Uh, links will be available on the HPPA um, website as well. So if you don't want to be seen in the videos, please turn off your camera. Um, you can change the way in which you want to see the uh, presentations with the presenter's face or the audience by clicking the view icon, which is on the top right. Uh, corner. Um, for asking questions from the lecturer um, at the end of the um, lectures, uh, please use Zoom to raise your hand or use the chat to let us know that you have a question. Then we will ask you to unmute to talk. Um, at the end, I would like to thank all the alumni who have supported HPPA 
um, and encourage everyone else to uh, be a member of HPPA and, 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 and support your organization. I would also like to thank the current HPPA board members that um, uh, strongly supported this idea of having a virtual symposium. Uh, Professor Michael Tomlin as the advisor of uh, the club HPPA um, for, this, uh, for his great um, guidance throughout this uh, process. Um, and I also like to thank the special uh, committee, uh, the planning committee and its chair Michelle Van Meter, and uh, uh, um, most importantly, all of you, the participants and speakers who are here uh, with us tonight. Um, so uh, I would like to ask uh, Michelle to say a few words and um, uh, to introduce the symposium committee uh, uh, members, if possible. Michelle. You are on, you are muted, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Meyer. Um, so, hello, my name and is Michael Michelle. Tomlin is joining us, so. Excellent. Um, so, hello, hello again, everyone. My name is Michelle Van Meter. Um, I graduated from the Historic Preservation Planning Program in 2018. Um, and since that time, I've been living and working in Davis, California. Uh, like Mayar, I'm currently a board member of HPBA, and for the past several months, I've been serving as chair of the Symposium Planning Committee. Um, it's really been such a pleasure to organize this event, and in the process, um, I've gotten to know many of you and learn about your unique specializations and interests. Um, and I would also really like to emphasize um, that we would not be meeting here this weekend um, if it were not for the hard work of all the members of the Planning Committee. Um, Mayar, um, who you have now all met, um, is an assistant professor of architecture and uh, director of the historic preservation and design. Oh, excuse me, um, director of historic preservation and design at Texas Tech University. Um, he was instrumental in managing the technical aspects of this event, uh, particularly with regard to setting up the platform and registration. Melanie Coulter, who graduated from HPP in 2017 currently works at, for the historic preservation architecture firm, Walter B. Melvin Architects in New York City and serves as an executive board member of the Roosevelt Island Historical Society. Melanie designed our awesome symposium logo uh, and established connections with AAP to spread the word about this event beyond our department. Um, Shannon Salento, also a member of the class of 2017, um, is currently the resources and land use specialist um, for the Upward, Upper Delaware Council and uh, is HPPA board secretary. Uh, Shannon spearheaded our social media promotion efforts for this event and um, has been the mastermind behind all of those posts you've been seeing on Instagram and on Facebook. And last but not least, Zoe Murad, who is a current student, um, is the current PSSO president and has been the liaison between our planning committee and um, the current um, HPP cohort. And now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Tomlin, who will be introducing Bishop Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs. Well, hello, group. It's good to see you all. My goodness, from everywhere around the world. It's absolutely delightful. Um, I have the honor of uh, introducing our keynote speaker. It, it came to me that Jennifer was uniquely qualified um, to address the kind of contemporary scene um, by virtue of the fact that um, she is already recognized as a leader. Um, it's in my history unique. Uh, there has been no other HPPA alum from the beginning of time, right? That has reached um, the status of a bishop, right? And uh, the unfortunate thing about my being a little late because I had to switch computers to get onto the system, right? My my background was designed uh, to um, share with you all um, the, the context in which that took place inside the cathedral in Syracuse. I attended the ceremony 
right? There are very few ordinations that I have attended, but I did attend the ordination. And I've watched Jennifer's rise um, through the ranks with amazing, uh, just, I mean, admiration. It's the only thing I can say. As a leader, right? Um, and in a leader, not by virtue of, of simply the fact that she's dealing with um, the entire diocese, right? Um, and all of the people uh, that are charged with the responsibility of all of the religious buildings in the diocese. Uh, but also she has been recently, and I had a little hand in this, of course, I suggested that she join the board of uh, Landmarks of Indiana and she was willing to do this. And I'm ever so happy to make that connection um, because as you all know, for years and years and years, I've talked about Richmond, Indiana. And it was in Richmond, Indiana that I made the suggestion to the people in the Episcopal Church and the Historic Landmarks Foundation that she somehow or another become involved with the Reed Memorial Church, which was empty right next door, right? So you can see um, we go back um, in any number of ways we've crossed. Um, as a, the other thing that I, sh I should point out that you probably don't know, um, that she she's a uh, triacylate and she does this cooking blog thing, right? Um, you know, it's the sort of things that would make Jeff Chusid envious, right? Um, but with that, um, Jennifer, the floor is yours. I'm delighted. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you all of you for the invitation to be here tonight. And I have to say, there's so many pieces of uh, my being here that just seem right on time. Michael, you may not remember exactly that it was 24 years ago this very day that you were at that ordination as I was ordained to the transitional diaconate in, at St. Paul's Cathedral in Syracuse. And so it feels like both a long time ago and almost yesterday because to be in this space and to see so many familiar faces and names and go, oh my goodness, I just remember when. And I'm grateful for the journey that's taken me from that moment to this one. And so I'm hoping that what we'll, what I'll do tonight is to start a conversation. It is not typically in my habit to, to do lectures because, you know, lectures coming from the bishop are not typically received well. <laughs> so I, um, I, I don't typically take that format. And the topic, which we'll be talking about around recontextualizing race and the work we do around planning and preservation, is one that I think is best done in a conversational style. So what I would like to do is to talk to you about the work that I'm involved in now and what undergirds that work, and then to have us have an open conversation. So I will, I'll start with the, um, the email that kind of got us here. I referenced this to the planning team a couple of evenings ago. And I still have this email, which is the other thing, you know, preservationists don't throw anything away. And so in my Google file, I have this email from 2016, I believe it is. It's 2021. Yes, five years ago, 2016 or 15, where there was a conversation going on in the Preservation um, Association of Central New York about gun violence. And at the time, I had been serving as the assistant to the Episcopal Bishop of Chicago, working on gun violence reduction. And started talking about what we could do about it as one of these intractable problems that seem to plague so many of our cities and actually not just our cities as we know, but suburban and um, increasingly rural environments. Gun violence is a, is a problem. And so how do we get at it and how do we do it working um, collaboratively? And I would say that one of the greatest lessons I've learned from my time at Cornell and then seminary is that nothing good happens when you work in silos. Um, my master's thesis was really about how preservationists and religious property owners and philanthropists could come together to somehow um, create the circumstances for town revitalizations using church buildings, religious property buildings as 
community spaces. And I'm privileged to get to do some of that work as well as we do that work here in Indiana. As Michael alluded, my role as bishop is one where I have the spiritual care of a community, but also, as it turns out, so many buildings. Uh, the way a diocese is, is um, understood in the Episcopal Church, it's a geographical region, which in my case encompasses central and southern Indiana, basically going from West Lafayette and the north all the way down to the Kentucky border to the south and river to river between Illinois and Ohio. So 48 communities, an Episcopal school, lots of ancillary buildings, lots of sanctuaries, and lots of people worried about what to do with the building. And trying to get at that question, how do we care for religious properties, was the thing that sent me to Cornell in the first place. But I've always thought that now that um, I've become bishop, that there's an opportunity to think creatively about buildings, about how we really work at some of these seemingly intract intractable problems. Poverty, racial injustice, um, housing uh, vulnerabilities, all of these things which are at the heart and soul of the work that we do as preservation planners, you know, community redevelopment, all of those things are, are key. And it's interesting to me now that we are in the place in these United States of America that we're in, that the conversations about how we care for all of those issues is everywhere, at least in my space. It's preservationists and planners and urban designers are talking about these issues. Public policy folks, folks who are just wanting to figure out how to make it through the day or trying to figure out how do we improve our communities. In the last year, we've had some really hard conversations too around race. And what I want to do tonight is talk about race and systemic racism and preservation and planning. And I will beg your indulgence as I really center this conversation on the American context, which is the one I know most. And hoping that as we talk about some of these things, um, that we're able to really contextualize them in our own place, wherever that is, whether you're in the United States or, or working someplace else around the globe. In 2020, which was such a hard year in so many ways, I remember almost about this time last year, people talking about the racial reckoning that the United States was in the midst of. You remember we were just a few weeks out from the murder of George Floyd and protests were happening in cities in, across the country and around the globe, actually, not just the United States, but in Europe, people were protesting about um, Black Lives Mattering more and the need for something to change because the injustices have reached such a bubbling point that people can't take it anymore. And there had begun this real interesting um, language, at least in my communities, where people talked about the dual pandemics of both COVID-19 and racial injustice and oppression. And I thought, that's one way to think about what we're in the midst of in this really, really hard time when we were socially distanced and quarantining and people were dying by the hundreds in large, dense urban spaces. And people were also trying to figure out how to protest in the midst of all of those restrictions. And what I thought I saw was that we had the pre-existing condition of racial injustice and oppression upon which COVID-19 was layered upon. And so if we're gonna use medical metaphors, which is the extent of what I know about medicine because I'm a preservationist and a church person, like that's where I thought was the more apt way to describe it. That we had the pre-existing condition of systemic racism and injustice. And on top of that, you could just pile all the other things that have been vexing our society and the pandemic, which was one of the most acute things we've experienced, um, was sort of one of the most latest and devastating instances of what happens when you keep layering upon injustices to disastrous effects. It occurred to me though, as we were going through this past year with lots of time perhaps, um, if we were lucky enough to be able to quarantine safely and work from home, to, um, for, I had a lot of time to reflect and to think you know, how do we get at some of these issues? And what I'm hoping we can talk about tonight is the ways in which the fields of historic preservation and 
the allied disciplines of urban and regional planning and architecture and real estate and landscape design, how those disciplines, the ones that we care so much about, can be a part of the solution instead of playing too often unwillingly, unwittingly, in the role of being complicit in perpetuating the circumstances that we are trying to actually undo. If I were to think about the reckoning, that was the reckoning for me. And it could be that I had been doing so much in the church world that I didn't really pay as much attention to that. I had been working in historic preservation since I graduated on the local small scale. Every church I served, I would do something around preservation projects or consult here and there. But it only occurred to me last year, really, that so many of the sources of discomfort and distress in society are problems that we preservationists and planners are actually equipped to solve. And that we have some repair work that I think our disciplines are um, must do because we're part of the problem too often, at least historically anyway. Maybe this is not an epiphany for you. <laughs> Maybe you've, you've been spending your time trying to, to right those wrongs. It's been interesting as I've even looked at recent thesis um, papers coming out of Cornell and Syracuse and people writing about the effects of urban renewal and how to look at it, not just as a planning problem, but as a problem of injustice that had not been looked at through that lens and how it's necessary to perhaps take a different lens at it to, to make, actually get to different results. I think it's really important and it changes things when we listen to those who don't often get listened to. And that is often a part of what my day is about is to listen to the people on the margins, those who feel invisible, those who feel like they have been silenced in one way or the other or overlooked because they are under-resourced or um, housing vulnerable or whatever it is that puts them on the margins. And what would it mean to center those voices and those lives in the work we do? It's a question I would wanna raise. Every now and again, I will hear just from conversations primarily rooted in the religious landscape, but people saying things like, the place I live in was not designed with me in mind. What do, when do we get to have things that are preserved or designed or planned for us? and that us usually meaning a community of color that's been in distress for generations. It's a question that brings me up short, I will admit, because a lot of those spaces, if not initially, certainly not since some of the, their, um, since they were created, were not designed with the people who are most likely to use them at the table, at the drafting board. And so, the question we have before us now is how can we shift that? What are the ways in which, in looking at the past and the ways in which communities and histories and cultural artifacts have been erased in the name of progress, what can we do now to shift and change things? I, I know we've been working forever to improve communities and those attempts have yielded some um, incremental results and change takes a long time. But I think it's a different moment now where we actually have to be compelled to include a variety of voices at the table that didn't often get to the table, to look at the displaced stakeholders in the communities and put them into the process of decision-making from the very beginning, which is not typically the way I think our fields operate. I've been taken by the work of Justin Garrett Moore, who you may know of his work. He had formerly been in New York City and is now the program officer for the Humanities in Place program at the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And he said this last year in a piece he wrote that gave me some more fodder to think of. He said, New York has been shaped and reshaped in many ways over, over time, but we must acknowledge that it has not always been built for the benefit of all. For generations, elite white men decided for the most part how the city's common spaces were planned, designed, built, operated and maintained. Former New York City Planning Commissioner Robert Moses famously made structural racism literal with his highway and park designs that bulldozed lower income communities. 
The reality is that New York, like most cities, has been designed for difference, he wrote. He said segregation in housing and schools, unequal and unjust investment in public spaces, infrastructure and services, and a lack of representation of the multitude in the commons. And of course, by reinforcing the indelible marks of the city's income and wealth inequality have been baked in, close quote. So friends, I wanna suggest that if there are conversations happening in the preservation community in the planning field around systemic racism, white supremacy and injustice. If those conversations are happening, I would love to know about it, but I have a sense that they are not happening to a large degree, maybe here and there. But I believe like the church where I spend a lot of my time, most of my time, it's a conversation we have to have if we want to be different. And it is from not having those conversations and talking about how to name the thing that is the, the sickness really in our society without naming it and then figuring out how we each in our own way can chip away at it to dismantle the systems that keep making this work that we're about so hard. Um, if, if we're not all leaning into that, we're not gonna get to where we wanna go or at least where we say we wanna go. So I want to um, define some terms. Every now and again, I'll get a piece of hate mail from someone who's upset about the terms I used, which are, you know, technical terms for the most part around systemic racism or white supremacy in particular. And I'll just note that using that language, which is one that we use all the time in the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis, because we talk about how to dismantle racism, systemic racism all the time. And so I forget sometimes that not everybody talks this way. So I want to talk about white supremacy and not think about it so much as um, isolated incidences of KKK members in white hooded robes, right? Like that might be the thing that comes to mind most um, visually, particularly out of a, a time in our history when that was pretty much the only way to think about it. But I want to think about that term and use it in the way folks in the field use it, which is about a more structural and then more deep-seated um, dynamic where you create and have systems where whites disproportionately and systemically, systematically are advantaged over people of color. And so without being able to understand some of those dynamics at work and the enduring effect of multi-generational campaigns of, of um, this sort of advantaging one group over another, we're not able to, I think, really get at how to fix that piece that's keeping us from doing the work that we want to do to create beautiful, safe communities for everybody and histories, buildings, artifacts that are preserved that tells the whole story of all of us in the United States. If we're not able to name that and to think about how do we design, how do we preserve, how do we tell the stories and, and um, preserve the landscapes of a wide variety of experiences, then we're going to be doing less than I think is possible um, and necessary for the good of the field and for the good of the people that we're actually trying to um, work on, on, on their behalf. So, if you can name it, I think it gets us out of the um, tendency to be just automatically complicit in perpetuating the systems we're trying to undo. I'm going to tell, um, I'm going to show some images to help explain sort of what this looks like. I'll start with just naming a story, my experience of being in Syracuse when I served as the rector of Grace Church in Syracuse and chaplain at Syracuse University. I was there from 2004 to 2012, and I'll note that when I arrived, there had been great hopes that there might be some uh, repaired work done in what's called the 15th Ward, which is one of the neighborhoods of Syracuse where Highway I-81 was coming through and basically bulldozed a good part of the historic Black community that had been there. A neighborhood of Black folks who were primarily renters, renting from a, primary, a formerly primarily Jewish community and had been displaced by all of the typical means of the day. This was actually quite early in the late 1950s 
um, to make way for the highway, the state way it was, as it was called. And so Grace Church was an integrated, still is an integrated parish of almost half black and whites, which is not a common thing in the Episcopal Church. It is still true as Martin Luther King Jr. once quipped that, you know, 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. And unfortunately, that is still too true. But Grace Church is different. They were and are a, co a congregation that had been reunited as a black and white church because St. Philip's Episcopal Church was in the path of the highway, the black church that had been birthed out of Grace Church um, previously. And when that building was taken down, the St. Philip's building, those black members came over to Grace Church and stayed and created an integrated congregation. The pain, and, and that by that I mean literal trauma that still resides in that community, is that Highway 81 ended up being built across the street from where St. Philip sat. And so the building was demolished for no good reason. And I believe there's still a parking lot there on the corner to this day. And there are stories like that across the country, as we well know. But being a pastor to, to the community, which is trying to figure out how to heal and do something different there is one that will stay with me the rest of my days because 50 years after the fact, living members in their oral histories and the ways in which they were trying to eke out their life were still living with the pain of that um, scar in the neighborhood in ways that were just as if it had happened the day before. I stay on the PACNI listserv because I care about Syracuse, even though I haven't lived there since 2012. And it's fascinating to me that the conversations that began in about 2005 or six around what to do about the highway that was reaching the end of its natural life and was needing to be dealt with, repaired or taken down. Those conversations, I think they're just a little bit further than they were when I left almost 10 years ago, but they're, they're still trying to figure it out. It takes forever. And the conversations that I remember and I see as I read the listserv now go like, well, you know, who are you going to privilege? The people who live in the suburbs who just want to get quickly through the city or the people who actually live there in the city and have to have to subject themselves to the highway. So thinking about the people who don't get to say, have a say would change that conversation makes it more complicated, but it changes the conversation. Here in Indianapolis, we are working on a project that's very, very similar. And Michael Tomlin, I will just note that you'll just love the fact that I had breakfast this morning with Claudia Polly, who is um, an Indianapolis native, now lives on the West Coast, but she is back in town as we try to do the work of repair on historic Indiana Avenue, which was one of the historic black communities, really the sort of black Wall Street of Indianapolis, where Madam C.J. Walker had her home and headquarters and a theater is the one left, one building left in that neighborhood, which is a vestige really of the sort of prime era there. I'm gonna share my screen. So give me just a moment as I figure out how to do this and bring up the right slide. Let's see. Okay, so what I hope you see here is the slide, um, uh, it's a historical map of Indiana Avenue in 1937. If I can use my cursor here, you can see at the bottom right hand of the screen, I'm sort of turning my cursor around to this point at the corner of Indiana Avenue and over here is sort of West Street. And this is the, the property we're talking about. This is where the Madam C.J. Walker theater is now. And all of these dots um, represent where there were black houses, black households, and, um, and then you'll see just commercial buildings and just a really different kind of neighborhood back um, some, I don't know, 80 something years ago. Here's a photographic um, image of that neighborhood. And so again, here's the Madam Walker building. And these are all, this, this is a really intact neighborhood. And you'll just know that again, you can tell this is a, a, a slideshow of 
a particular slice of Indianapolis, but I think any one of you could do the slideshow with the place where you live. This is 1962, and just to reorient, it's a little fuzzy here, but here's that corner, and you can just see that there's density, density loss as lot sizes change, and um, there's just a sense of which there's folks are leaving. Here's 19, oh, I just skipped that. How do I get back there? 1972, and um, lots of empty lots here. So here's that same point. Here's 1986. Oh, how do I get that from moving so fast? I'm going to try and see if I can hold that. I'm going to put a, a cursor over here. This is where this is circling sort of almost in the middle towards the top here is St. Philip's Episcopal Church, which is one of the churches um, that is a part of the Episcopal Diocese. And here's a, a low income housing facility that was built in the 70s in partnership with the church and a whole bunch of empty lots as um, folks moved and the encroachment, and this, these parking lots are sort of showing what's becoming the creeping encroachment of the uh, Indianapolis University, Purdue University at Indianapolis, IUPUI, the, the campus there. So here's that, that peak here on the, where my cursor is, that's the Mount Walker Theater. Here's St. Philip's Church and a whole bunch of parking where there used to be houses. Here's 2010. You can see again, much more parking. Here's the theater. Here's the church. Lots of parking lots. And here's uh, last year. And the question we're asking now is, with buildings, uh, in, almost in the middle of the screen, you see a loan building. This is for sale. And we're trying to figure out how can we take this little piece of property and we create something different for the future that honors the neighborhood, the history that was, and actually makes it a place where people want to live and be at ground level again, instead of having what's essentially a four-way high, uh, sort of divided highway running through it. I walk this neighborhood often and it's almost impossible to navigate on foot because of the scale, which is not built for human um, navigation, really. Not on foot anyway. I'm going to show you a conceptual drawing that will depict what we think could be possible if we create a different um, possibility there. And this is where we're we're not sure what will actually come to pass, but we're going to give it a shot. So right now, Olin Dotson, who is a professor at Ball State in the preservation and architecture programs there, has been helping us figure out, well, you know, what if we imagined a different future? The community has worked really hard to um, to stop a plan that would have created a high density housing project for um, students and young adults that might that would have increased the density but not done nothing to create a sense of scale and so the um oh, let's see if i can move my slides here the uh alternative concept might be something like this image where there's a reintroduction of a street that was paved over, California Street here where my curse is going up and down and you have a really different scale of multi-use um, buildings, retail, housing, um, jazz clubs to, to um, resurrect the jazz and musical heritage of this neighborhood, which was once one of the music centers of Indianapolis. Um, ideas that you would provide for parking and doing something that's in conversation with St. Philip's Church, which though the congregation dates to the 1880s, their building um, is quite historically significant on the National Register and is one that has a partic particular um, light and window effect that necessitates not having buildings overshadowing it greatly. So, so you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to do now, knowing what we know about um, 
making something right that had been wrong. Here are, again, other images about what could be in that neighborhood, more scale to the human um, walkability scale than the neighborhood currently is. But is this the chance to do something different is the, the question. Um, I'm going to close with thinking about how do we then talk about these things. And I'm going to go back to the work of uh, Justin Garrett Moore, who's introduced me to the Black Space Manifesto, which if you know this, um, I, I, I applaud you. It's new to me, it, but this Black Space uh, Collective is a group of architects and artists and activists, designers, who are trying to change the way we do preservation, planning, renovation of our communities. And it takes into account certain principles, things, and I'll just sort of read these quickly, where they say that um, if we're going to design well for everybody and seeing the, um, the work of preservation, planning, design as a way to, um, to repair the community, that we would do this by creating circles, not lines, by having a flatter hierarchy that includes more people, um, more dialogue, that there would be, um, that you would choose critical connections over critical mass, quality over quantity, focus on critical and authentic relationships to, to support mutual adaptation and evolution over time, that projects would move at the speed of trust, which is something we say in the church a lot, where you grow trust and move together with fluidity at whatever speed is necessary. That notion that you can only move um, your relationships, projects move at the speed of trust, where if we're not naming the things that get in the way and systemic racism is one of them, one of those dynamics that people typically don't want to talk about, but then not talking about it means that we're not able to build the trust to get to the kind of projects that might actually benefit everybody. The manifesto includes being, being humble learners who practice deep listening and to approach the work with an attitude towards learning without assumptions and predetermined solutions taking criticism without dispute, that they would celebrate, catalyze, and amplify Black joy. You may have heard that term a lot over the last year, even in the pandemic with vulnerable communities of color taking the brunt of the pandemic, there was a sense in which there was a need even as a way of preservation to celebrate Black joy and to laugh and have humor and gratitude. This particular point around planning with, designing with, walking with people as they imagine and realize their own futures and being connectors and conveners and collaborators, collaborators, not just representatives. To center the lived experience um, as an important expertise. And so not saying that having lots of letters after your name and degrees is not important, but lived, ex lived experience also is a teacher from which we can all learn. And then to seek people at the margins and to acknowledge the structures that create and maintain and uphold in inequity and to learn and practice new ways of intentionally making space for marginalized voices, stories, and bodies. I'm going to stop sharing this my screen here. So that's a lot. It's, um, but I am convinced that we are people who are called particularly in the preservation space to think about what is it that we have the opportunity to preserve and to perhaps cast our gaze a little bit more broadly than we typically do and to ask different questions and to invite different people to the table who might not often get there. Our field, as a, I remember taking, you know, the sort of intro to Preservation 101 and thinking about the very beginnings of the preservation movement as it's typically told and Mount Vernon and all of those things. And it's a particular slice of how we began this, this discipline in the United States. And we have been working, as far as I know, for the last 20 something years in a critical way to think more broadly about who's included in preservation. How do we preserve things like native indigenous languages? Because there are so few artifacts in the indigenous landscape to preserve. So how do we think about cultural artifacts differently? How do we think about whose neighborhoods get to be preserved? and reviewed and listed. What is the definition of significance, historically significance? So 
I don't have answers for you. I have lots of questions though. And I think that in the asking of the questions, we are more live, likely to get to the answers that are going to serve not just the preservation field, but everybody. We are complicit and we have power and we have resources and leverage and skills and networks to make our communities radically different. And I think because people are talking about dismantling racism in a way that I've not heard in my lifetime and because there's just a thing about where we are in our country, particularly where folks think we have a moment that's now where if we can all just lean on a little bit, we can actually undo the damage of urban renewal of the last century. We can actually solve some of the problems around housing access. We can do it if we're talking, I think, in these broader terms. And it doesn't make, mean it's easier. It makes it a lot harder, actually, but it's totally worth it if we can take the time to include the voices that need to be there. So thank you for allowing me to share a few thoughts about this. And I would love to talk about what's on your mind, what this raises for you. Are there projects and things that are in your uh, portfolio that are similar that you think can be instructive to us? And let's get a, a dialogue going so we can make some change. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Now, we have um, Zoe monitoring the chat, but in the meantime, anybody who wants to raise their hand or use the, the, the Zoom hand raising function, um, come forward. such silence, uncharacteristic. I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Um, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And um, part of what I wanted to say is a little bit of reassurance. Um, I actually sent you um, our colloquium speaker list for this year because Justin Garrett Moore we had last year and we've had some very interesting people who are in deeply engaged with these issues come and speak to us at Cornell this year. And, and you're right, it's, it's, um, it's essential and it requires a lot of rethinking. And we've had as a college um, diversity and inclusion committee and several town halls. And it was sort of interesting that city planning has had a diversity inclusion committee since the 1970s. That sounds good at one level. At another level, it's like, so what have we accomplished? But, but what was striking is there has not been any such committees for the other two departments in the college until this year. And so, so, that, so the conversations have really begun uh, I think to be taken deeply. And of course the students have been a lot of the impetus. And I think one of the really critical aspects of it is, is diversifying the student body because it's the students who push us, bring the insights and also compel us to teach what's meaningful. And so We've had some level of success at the undergraduate level. We, um, the URS program now, our undergraduate regional sciences, um, has much more diverse student body than a, even just a few years ago. The graduate level, it's much slower and more difficult. And I think it's, it's an important challenge that we look at as a department. Um, but I think the, you know, it's the, the nature of the conversations that we're having, I hope begin to reflect some of the things that, that you address and, and, um, and it can't be said enough, you know, and, and I think part of the hard part 
in some ways is going to a place like Syracuse, walking around, looking at the damage and then saying, look at what we did. And then feeling almost overwhelmed. The other side of it is obviously what you showed with your designs was a certain level of, of um, possibility. And similarly, in some of the workshops, like we did a workshop in Cleveland with Midtown Cleveland, was trying to do something similar. Just the sheer enthusiasm of the community and the almost, I don't want to, you know, the word gratitude almost seems wrong, but just to be listened to and be part of a process, a design process for their own community is the energy that helps us overcome that, um, the sense of guilt and the sense of like, well, what next? Um, so I think the, that ending with that possibility and then how to make these things happen, that's, that can raise the passion again. So, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Others? It's interesting that you were discussing Professor Dotson's work. Um, of course, he was at the Richmond conference, so we had a gr great time going you know, through memory land, lane in many respects. Um, the thing that um, came out of that particular meeting in Richmond, um, because I was asked to comment, and of course, having done the survey in the 70s, and then I returned before the conference, which is all on a YouTube if anybody cares, but um, I, I returned basically to the same neighborhoods uh, to examine um, the same communities. It was very interesting, in fact, a very striking aspect of that conference sticks in my head is there was a patrolman who is now the chief of police in Richmond, Indiana. The patrolman is one I had met when doing the survey with the students on the ground. And he was able to give me a snapshot of the change in each of the neighborhoods over time in such a way as to understand that the demographic profile and the crime, because we began with the question that drug uh, enforcement is difficult, it's again racially charged and the question of safety and the, and the question of how it is that we teach um, people about gun violence right is something um, that has to be somehow infused right now you remember the mrp student who essentially in uh, the southwest was injured and remains you know, at the forefront of passing some sort of gun violence, anti-gun violence law at the federal level. Um, so we all have a role to play, regardless of where we are, um, in the manner in which this, this comes out in, in a political sense. But as you're suggesting, at a local level, um, the question is, well, how is it that you manage uh, to address the concerns of the people in those houses, um, in, those, in those locations. Um, and of course, the thing that has changed for the students um, is that I've introduced much more cross-cultural uh, comparison in the survey class that alongside the question of what style it is, who lives there is part of the, the discussion um, that is the, the change in the program, which has, in a sense, been revisited by the students in their theses and their field projects. Um, so we're making headway. Um, and to comment a little bit further on, on Jeff's um, or, or thoughts, the faculty is different than it was back in the 70s. The students are different than it was in the 70s. I'm old enough to remember in real time 
all of the faculty and all of the students and their trajectories have been fascinating to me. Um, but we're educating people in a different way today in preservation than we, when we had. Um, it's not as though we're de-emphasizing the community work at all. In fact, it is uh, increasing, but it's increasingly sensitive to issues which we didn't talk about back in the 60s and 70s. And we're now talking about them much more explicitly. Well, and I think that's, I mean, I, you know, I, I will say this, this is the, the hard thing about this conversation, particularly in this space, is that the Cornell Preservation Program is not designed to talk about this in that explicit way. And yet, I think it has to be woven in. And where I spend a lot of my time as bishop is trying to help people think about their lives in an integrated way, meaning as in a coherent, cohesive life. And that means that understanding how the world works and how things are racialized and divided and segregated by class in this country has a bearing on every single thing you do, whether you're flipping burgers at Burger King or whether you're designing sky rises in New York, like it's impacting us all the time. So having an awareness about it and doing our own individual work is what I would say in, in the church context is that we've got to confront the things that get in the way from us being able to relate to one another as people, period. And then that's going to inform how we do the work of preservation. And so it's, there, there is no one um, entry point into doing this work. It's because to get to a more diverse student body, to get to a more diverse curriculum, to get to the kind of communities we want to shift means that I guess what I'm looking for is a more global consciousness raising about all of these things so that in the aggregate, we're able to see the shifts that we're making and, the, and we begin to ask different questions as we do our work. Who's at the table? Who is this for? Who benefits? Who doesn't? Who's invisible here? And just taking an inventory that way shifts the outcome. Just It just does if we're asking those kinds of questions. Rachel, you had your hand up. Did you want to, Rachel Lieberts, did you want to get in there? Thank you. I just wanted to thank you also for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm here in Syracuse. Ah. Uh, I'm relatively new to New York. I've been here about three years. I'm from Chicago. And um, I served for five years as the Deputy Historic uh, State Historic Preservation Officer in Illinois, where I'm from. And so I know Indianapolis well, too. So, But um, here in Syracuse, I find it really interesting um, Recently, I was representing PACNI, and I'm glad you still get those emails. Um, I was representing PACNI at um, a Section 106 consulting parties meeting um, on I-81. And um, there were several other advocates there who were interested in um, not only uh, Oakwood Cemetery, which used mm -hmm. to be sort of a I guess you would call it the lungs of the city. It was the city's first park. It's listed in the National Register of Historic Places at the national level of significance. Um, and it was severed from the Southside community. Um, they used to have direct access to it at the grand entrance gates. And um, they used to be able to just walk right through and enjoy that park and, and 81 took that away. We're hopeful um, that continued advocacy can perhaps um, encourage the DOT as they move forward with their plans. And as you say, it's slow going conversations um, going forward, but um, to, to, to hope to encourage the DOT to, with the community grid plan, kind of reconnect those neighborhoods. And um, another concern that we had as a group of advocates um, in these consulting parties discussions was the um, potential to list the pioneer homes um, to the National yeah. Register of Historic Places. And I've worked at two ship bows. I was also at Texas as a historian there. And I've seen um, New Deal era public housing complexes uh, at different levels of condition and condition being separate from integrity, but their significance is clearly recognized and not only for architecture, um, 
but but I've seen them rehabilitated successfully, updated on their interior so they are comfortable places for people to live in the 21st century, but they still have that neighborhood feel, that human sense of scale. And it just occurred to me, I just wanted to say that at this consulting parties meeting, there were no, there were no people of color. And so whether or not they were aware that conversations were taking place and they could ask to be a part of that, um, I'm not really sure, but there were no people of color at the table. And that was very disheartening to me. Um, and so I don't know how we get um, our state historic preservation offices and our state and federal agencies to recognize that they really sometimes need to go above and beyond the typical public notice in the paper. And they should really be a little more creative with who are they including or inviting to these meetings, these conversations, and to cast their nets as widely as possible. Um, because I think it's really important for people to be able to advocate for themselves or have their voices heard. And they may all be very different, those voices. They're not all gonna be in concert. They're not, but we need to be sure that we, that we include those voices and listen. And I'm just very concerned about that. So as preservation advocates, as we're all either be, you know, being trained to become or we are, I just wanna encourage people also not only to, to, um, to listen as you were telling us to do, make sure that we listen. We, we have to make sure that everybody's invited at the table. And I also just wanna make sure that we're not only looking at something for its physical appearance, right? We're talking about people's homes, their neighborhoods, their places, the places where they live. And sometimes it's not criterion C for architecture. And I can't imagine nominating something without a criterion A consideration ever. So um, what is the social history? What is the cultural history? What, what are the stories of people? So I really wanna thank you for your, um, your presentation. Thank, thank you, Rachel. And thank you for that comment. Now I'll note that the, the person who holds the second highest position in the Episcopal Church as a lay leader grew up in pioneer homes. Byron Rushing, one of the longest serving state, Senate, state representatives in the House of, in Massachusetts, just retired a few years ago from 31 years um, in the House and affected marriage equality that became a national, grew up there. So there's, you know, it's funny to hear him tell the stories about what it's like to have been there as a child. Um, and yet he would love to know that that's actually a conversation. He, he works in, um, Black historical circles in Boston now, and I'll make sure he know he knows what's happening. So thank you for that. I see Jeff and then Sherry. Actually, Sherry, I think had her hand up before me. Okay, so Sherry. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Jeff. You are too kind, Bishop. Thank you for your talk. That was. Uh, I am feeling re-energized. Thank you for that. Uh, I often say in public service, every day is a due day for someone to call me stupid or threaten to have me fired. So uh, it's, it's good to feel re-energized again. And uh, just a quick shout out to Rachel. She and I were recently on a uh, panel uh, discussing infrastructure, uh, a niche subject that I'm interested in, uh, parking lots. But, um, I, you know, I do share that concern about engaging communities. Uh, it is so challenging, particularly at the federal level, because we are not right there with the community. We are in Washington, D.C. for the most part. And um, my first 10 years out of grad school, I actually worked as a landscape architect at the local level and was very engaged with communities and often found uh, rather confused responses when I would invite people into these conversations. I recall clearly contacting uh, the municipal police department and wanting to speak to the two officers that had the beat where I was designing a park because I wanted to understand their concerns about this space, what, uh, what their, uh, perhaps if they had any safety concerns for that area or, or if not, but they were absolutely baffled as to why somebody at DC Parks and Recreation was calling them for their input. 
Uh, so even once we can try and engage, just trying to get uh, the conversation going is so challenging. That said, that is not something we're going to stop doing. So um, again, I thank you uh, for uh, re-energizing me in, in that respect. Well, thanks, Sherry, and uh, good luck with all of that. Getting the conversation is, uh, it's hard, but I will say we, the, the whole community loses when we don't talk about the things that we, like when we don't engage. And so maybe those inroads little by little will help people get to the table a little quicker. Yeah, Jeff? Thank you. I just wanted to very quickly note that we have a new faculty member joining us um, in the fall, Sarah Bronin, uh, who's actually a Mexican-American preservationist. And she, one of her major projects, she'll be joining as a full professor, one of her major projects has been something called desegregating Connecticut. And so she's been really clear about tying preservation to zoning and segregation and its history, as well as to climate change. And what makes me optimistic about um, one of the points that, that Rachel made is that um, there's a possibility that she may also be the next chair of the advisory council which suggests that someone who really cares about these kinds of communities, um, you know, could be in there. I mean, I think there's certainly interest in the Biden administration in getting a more responsive advisory council. And, and so we'll see, I mean, but I think, I think the points, you know, that, that everybody's making are, are more and more coming to the forefront of what we need to be doing, teaching and practicing as preservationists. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. I would audit that class. I mean, I think, you know, the, I mean, I don't know about you all, but I, I you know, we're, we're all in our spaces and our bubbles, like non-pandemic bubbles, just thinking about how we live and move in the world. And we, we get in our lane and we kind of stay there. And so every now and again, I'll lift, even I, who I'm trying to be conscious and I'll look up and I go, oh my gosh, like this is, there's segregated spaces and class segregated spaces all over the place. And I remember I would talk to folks in Winnetka, Illinois. I, I lived on the North shore when I was in Chicago and I'd be tasked with talking to folks in Winnetka, which is a, a pretty monolithic, very, very wealthy suburb North of Chicago. And people would say, well, what does the gun violence in Chicago have to do with me? I live here. And I, and I would say to them, <laughs> really pastorally, of course, I'd say, it has everything to do with you. You're only here because you don't want to be near that, right? Like, so let's talk about the zoning and that keeps you here and the real estate prices and, and the schools and all of that. That means that resources are here and not elsewhere. And so it's all interrelated. And so trying to help people see that the choices that they make every single day are either perpetuate or, or help transform the communities we live in. And it just happens. And it doesn't, an intervention doesn't change it unless we're consciously making different kind of decisions. And so that's why having you know, asking people like the police officers and the people who use the park, like, what do you want here matters because if you only ask the nannies who show up at the park what they want, you're going to get that, right? You're not going to get something that's going to really su support and serve the, the whole of the community. But seeing the, in, the connectivity across these really segregated spaces by race and class, I think is a, a key part of the, the work that we're, we're called to do just because it helps us do our work as preservationists and planners better. And so um, the hard thing is, is that finding them in our, each of our communities, what is the, what is the lever that needs to get pushed to get things going in significant in a way to make some progress? And that's the thing, because once you get going, once a community gets ignited around a kind of change process that brings more people to the table, things can really go. But it sometimes it takes a while to figure out what is that lever to push or who's the person in the community that really gets everybody else to the table. Like the stakeholders look different in different places, right? And sometimes you gotta 
almost in a community organizing fashion, find out who you can get on the ground. If you're in DC and you know you're trying to work for the community miles away, how do you work your networks to figure out who's on the ground there who can push the lever to get people to the table because everybody listens to that person. And so what I'm talking about seems like it's really big stuff because what we're trying to do is actually work not just at the technical level, but at the relational level, because all of the stuff that we're trying to do is all predicated on us being able to have relationships that span across a number of boundaries. And those are the kinds of soft skills and soft pieces of the work that has to be a part of what we do with the built environment work that we're working in. So it's it's sort of hardscape and softscape work, if I like to think about it. But without those relationships, you know, the planning, because we know this from working with planning teams, right? Like you can't get anywhere. So how do we then think differently about the networks of relationships that will get us to the people who we know can push that lever and help us get a little further down the road? Thank you, Jennifer. I think um, in the interest of time, we'll move right along. No, it's late. Thank you. Um, we very much appreciate it. Uh, now, next on the agenda, I was supposed to say something as a program update, but Jeff has already told you about the program update. We're getting a new preservation lawyer, so we can move past this. Oh, the other thing is that uh, Jeff is going to be chair for a little longer, right? Uh, just a little longer until the new chair comes in, one would assume January 1st, right? Correct. Right. So um, with the program update behind us, um, we get to do what Chusid, uh, I can't say does best because he does a lot of things, right? But one of the things that he does is show slides and talk about them, right? All yours, Jeff. <laughs> 